there's this small little story just that I always think about linked to that. It's, for example, we knew someone that was an alcoholic and that smoked a lot and all that. And then he started, I can't remember exactly, but he started going into sports, quit everything. And I told my dad, and I was younger, you know, this was 10 years ago or something. And I was like, oh, that's so awesome, you know, just to be able to do that change. And my dad was like, well, yes, but don't you think it's awesome for me that me, your dad, I never got into alcohol. I never smoked. I always had, you know, a good life. Obviously, nothing, nothing's perfect, but, you know, everything went more or less well. And I kept myself away from all these negative things. You know, it's just kind of something that stayed with me. It's, you know, it's true. We always put these people on a pedestal. And it's awesome if you can really change your life around. But it's also awesome if you didn't get into those things in the first place. Welcome back to the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. We are Jess and BJ, and this is the spot where we share stories of people looking, finding, and living their purpose. Although I've said this at least a few hundred times, we believe it's an important thing to remember that each one of us is here on purpose for a purpose. Our guest today found his purpose at the young age of five when his dream was born to win Kona as a professional triathlete. He was on the big island watching his dad, who remains one of the best in the world in his age group, compete at the Ironman World Championship. After graduating college in 2017, Rudy went right into triathlon as his singular focus, and although he is not even racing the Ironman distance yet, his dream remains very much alive, and I'd say he's well on his way to attaining it. At the age of 27, he's already gained some serious street cred, and with well over a decade, actually cl almost closer to two decades in the sport, he has several memorable performances under his belt, including ending Jesse Thomas's six-year win streak at Wildflower in 2018, which surprised everyone except for Rudy, a third-place finish at the 2019 Ironman 70.3 Worlds in Nice, France, as well as many podium finishes along the way, and a spectacular fifth place at Challenge Daytona at the end of 2020. Rudy is fresh off the North American Championship in St. George with a fourth place finish and a ton of momentum for a rock in 2021. He is currently ranked eighth in the world by the Professional Triathletes Organization, and surely we are to see him in the number one spot in the future. Although this is the first time we're meeting, I know that Rudy has a relentless fire to attain his goal and be the absolute best in whatever he pursues. So we're looking forward to diving into that fire, Rudy. Thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the intro and thank you for having me. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, <laughs> and the thing is, is like, You've been in this sport for so long. We, uh, we recently interviewed Ellie Salthouse and similarly, like, you know, she started triathlon when she was at age 10 or 11. So at her age, which I think she's around your age, like 27, she already yeah. has well over a decade in the sport and you've got a lot of years under your belt. Um, and I don't think a lot of people realize either that you raced, you raced the IT, you raced on the Olympic distance circuit for a while in ITU, um, in under 23 and, um, in the, in ju well, before juniors and then in juniors and then under 23. And that's when I started switching. And it's funny you mentioned Ellie because I was, when I went to Australia for my gap year during high school and college, I trained with her and her squad for five months in uh, Brisbane. Oh, very How old were you then? Uh, I was 18. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you guys, I think, are about the same age. Oh we're, man. Yeah, no, we're same year, I think. We're 93 both. Yeah. Wow. That's wild. Um, all right, cool. So there's a lot we want to dive into, but let's, uh, you're kind of hot off of St. George. I know it was a couple of weeks ago. And, um, but we want to know, like, did that leave you wanting more? Did that leave you with some fire to get after it? Definitely. And actually more than probably any race in the last year and a half, I'd say. Cause just really? Losing, Why? Well, I mean, the swim and the bike were fine. And yeah, that was good. But then the run, losing five minutes on the run to the best run times, that's just not acceptable for me. And just being passed and feeling kind of powerless on the run is, and just getting passed by these guys and going from being first and second to fourth or even fifth just because Daniel Beckgard didn't finish the race. 
but I would have been, finished fifth if, if it wasn't for that. So that was just, uh, yeah, I mean, we were just not like that as competitors. We want to be the best in all three disciplines, really, or at least be, you know, on par, but five minutes is way too much. And I just didn't feel really fit on the run, and I was just maxing out the whole run, couldn't accelerate, so that just really pissed me off, really. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you take that and, like, channel that into, you know, uh, some people can kind of get stuck there, right? Stuck in the disappointment, but you can also use it in a way to motivate you, to to drive you. So do you feel at all like the mind ever wanting to kind of get stuck in that disappointment? And how do you shift into, like, driving driving yourself forward, using it to your advantage? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm not, yeah, I would definitely wouldn't say I'm stuck in it. I mean, I when things like that happen, it just really increases my motivation, and I try to analyze every kind of side of the run performance and see what I can add to my training and around it, you know, just strength, mobility, uh, run technique, all that, um, to improve the run. So I just get really motivated. But then, obviously, when you start doing it, you know it's going to take months or years to actually improve it like quite a bit so it just takes time but i mean that's the name of the game you know that's what we've learned since we're young it's just patience and just plug along and just uh, keep on doing what you think is right for you and that's all you can do so you'll be back on the course in a few months and i will too i'll be there as well what um what do you what can you what can you take away that you're gonna that you apply to train a little bit differently because i know for myself you know, I'm definitely wasn't prepared for the long ups and the long downs. I was ready for hills, but not that extent. So I'd probably add that more into my training. But is there anything you can pinpoint? Because I think that's probably your your goal, um, your end goal for the year besides the Collins Cup. Um, so is there anything different that you can pinpoint you would do? Yeah, I'll come to that. Just I'll say that I think they, they're changing the course a little for Worlds. Oh, okay. Yeah, and uh, I heard it will be pretty hilly too, and almost the same actually, but yeah, it will be different. I don't know exactly. I thought they were going to change already for uh, two weeks ago, but I think some roads weren't quite ready yet. Mm. But uh, I mean, overall, I mean, the bike is still fast. You know, 201, it's a fast bike. It's not like, yeah, like Nice where it was more like 217, 220. Um, but definitely hilly, and then the run. Yeah, that's definitely the the biggest difference with the uh, other runs. Uh, as far as training differences, well, I learned more about tactics for the race. This was a kind of a similar field as a world championship, where there's a big front group. And uh, I mean, the main thing is try to save a little more energy on the bike. I was off the front with uh, Magnus Bitlev, and I mean that was good tactic i mean i don't want to just be stuck in the group but also i want to trust my run too so not be scared of being in the group and running off the bike with those guys so just uh yeah i was a little tired off the bike and then yeah just didn't have that much left for the run so for worlds i'll definitely have to just kind of save a little more and focus on a fast run but while still trying to get an edge on the other guys on the bike so there's going to be a, a balance there that i'll have to have and it's going to be and yeah, just tough to find that balance, but I'll have to find it if I want to. But you, be up there. you'll find it. Yeah, you'll find it. This is the this is this is why I asked that because we can get all caught up in like, well, here's the training, and and this is exactly what I'm going to do, and then and then when you get to race day, you've got to be an active participant the whole way through the race to see if you're pushing yourself to that max, knowing that you're probably risking a little bit potentially on the run, but have the confidence that you can show up when you need to show up. And that's a, that's pretty powerful. Yeah. And I mean, I think for me, the, the biggest thing, yeah, is just going to be really confident in my run, which will enable me to be okay with what, whatever dynamic happens on the bike. If I'm in the group, I'll be happy saving the watts. And then if I'm off the front also, that's fine too. I know I'm fit enough to run well off a hard bike too. So yeah, I think that'll be really important. I mean, especially on the, such a hilly course, if you feel not super fit on the run, I mean, these hills are going to crush you, you know? <laughs> and then on the downhills, you're just kind of going to let your your body gravity come come down, yeah? But those top, top runners, they can run almost as fast on that course than on a flat course because on the downhills, they're just running that much faster. And on the uphills, they're not losing that much time. So, yeah, that's pretty interesting. I mean, 111 flat, that 
Sam and Lionel ran, that's close to the, the really good times, yeah. So. What was your run time in St. George? One fifteen fifty five. Okay, one fifteen. yeah, so there's a few minutes there. And you, we think you can beat Sam and Lionel. Do you feel like you can beat Sam and Lionel too? Definitely, yeah, no, I think so too. But uh, I think you can, for yeah. sure. I, I think uh, they were in a better shape than me comparatively in St. George. I wasn't quite 100%. And okay, yeah, they ended up being about two minutes ahead of me at the finish. But yeah, definitely on my day, I think I can uh, beat those guys. But yeah, I've, I've never been Lionel. I've always been Li- uh, Sam. That's the first time he beat me. <laughs> but he, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he also elevated his level quite a bit. It's not like I regressed. So, uh, but yeah, right. no, definitely. Uh, I think I can be most of the guys on my day for sure. I love it. The fire is just like continues to get stoked and you guys continue to get, you know, better and better. Um, and you're, you're, in, are you in Boulder now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we used to live there. We lived there for about 10 years in Boulder. And yeah. um, we're curious to know, like just some of your favorite running routes there. Um, yeah. I think specifically running because you've got so much opportunity to run those canyons or the hills. Uh, what's some of your favorite spots there to train? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just a few minutes from the reservoir, Boulder Reservoir. So, I mean, uh, that's most of my runs are there. Um, we just, for our, a long run we always do is uh, we head out, it's called the Grand, Grange Loop, Grange Loop, and we head out to Nelson Road. And it's, uh, mm-hmm. you know, 15, you can do about 15 mile loop. And yeah, it's pretty nice. There's, there's hills, it's the perfect mix of, uh, just good flat running, false flats, and some hills. And, uh, yeah, there's dirt roads that go forever there, so you can do all sorts of loops. And Yeah, it's yeah and cool. absolutely no shade whatsoever. <laughs> no, yeah, pretty much none. <laughs> so what's awesome with Boulder, yeah, is you can do so many loops in every direction. There's so many trailheads and different just dirt paths, dirt roads, and they all connect with bike paths. And it's just, yeah, it's really, I think, best running in the world, really. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I mean, obviously, it's the reason why you all live there. That's where we got into triathlon was when we lived in Boulder. Um, is uh, Boulder 70.3 on your radar for this year? No, it looks like I'll be in Europe for all summer. I'm going to go around mid-June. And then I'll have two races at the end of June and then being of uh, July. And then I'll go two weeks to Lanzarote to work with an osteo guy to look at all my running and my just physical limitation or just my structural limitations for now and work on that and then by then it will be end of july so there's no point for me to come back to boulder for the con because the cons cup will be in europe end of august so yeah it will be two 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 and a half months in in europe cool let's uh let's talk a little bit about the collins cup and and uh maybe we'll lead into this by talking about the pto like you're yeah you've been in the sport for a really long time but what we've seen the PTO bring you guys to elevate, you know, the level of professionalism and paying you like professional athletes um, and supporting you and getting coverage and expanding the sport. Like, what does it mean to you to be really like you're, you're escalating to the top of your game in the midst of triathlon really blowing up? Yeah. I mean, the PTO is really a game changer for us triathletes. I mean, before then it was just, you know, we're racing these races of this individual business, really, Ironman. And we had no control over our future, over our financial future. And Ironman wouldn't promote us. It was really just, yeah, we're just living through a business that doesn't really value us as a, a part, as a, an, you know, just a, a positive part for the business, you know. So PTO, yeah, is obviously awesome for that. They promote us. Um, financially it looks like it can be it is already a game changer and it can be even more once they can bring big sponsors you know such as banks and just the the real big businesses of this world and um yeah so i mean it's pretty awesome yeah and exactly as you were saying it's it kind of coincides with the beginning of my career uh being at the highest level and uh and i have quite a bit of time left too so um yeah i mean great timing and it's really awesome for us pro athletes. Yeah. And, and you have a marketing degree, right? That's right. 
So how do you perceive the creativity and branding of the athletes and how they're showcasing you um, and how the PTO is doing a, a, a job of that? Do you feel like, uh, do you feel like it's representing you guys uh, really truly to, to who you are? Yeah. And uh, well, so, yeah, I mean, that's really important, obviously, to, to build the, the athletes themselves, the individuals. Because, I mean, we, that's how we see it in other sports. You know, it's really individual athletes, these big stars that really carry a sport. And um, I think they're just doing it right. And they actually contacted me now to, to do this uh, series called Unbreakable. So they really just want to see, show actually this side of the athletes that's never shown in other cases on social media. You know, we just always try to show the kind of the good side. I know we just don't automatically talk about the negative parts of our lives and link to training but also personal and private stuff so i think that's part of their marketing strategy is kind of showing just the whole athlete not as just a professional that looks like he has everything under control but just yeah show those other sides so uh, they were just asking me actually uh, when i could film for that um whether it's here in europe when i'll go soon so uh, yeah i think just this whole strategy is what we need and uh just have big personalities in the sport emerge, such as Sam Long, for example. I mean, he's been great for the sport and the media around triathlon, for example. And, uh, yeah, I, I hope I can also be part of that uh, little by little. <laughs> but it's, it's interesting because, yeah. I mean, the more video stuff I do and the more podcasts, for example, I try to really have the real me come out because I'm uh, naturally pretty in, in, of an introvert. And so... You know, you don't really express yourself the way you really are when you're like that. And obviously, when you get older, well, that comes out of you and you come out of your shell. But yeah, it's just something even when you're you get older, it's sometimes not easy to really show the real you, you know, in, in public or just, yeah, social media and stuff. Yeah. And really what you're talking about is another word for it is like vulnerability, right? Like sh showing us who you really are. Like, what do you care about? What do you love in this life? What matters to you? And, um, vulnerability is something, um, I'd be interested to see, like, what, when I say that word vulnerability, like, how does that hit you as a professional triathlete who, you know, you, you're an entrepreneur in and of yourself, marketing yourself, competing against these other guys. And there's this level of like, well, I can't let them in too much. Mm -hmm. Right. But also you letting people in is really what is going to allow people to relate to you and get a lot of energy behind you as well for your success. So how does vulnerability sit with you as an athlete? Yeah. I mean, it's, as you said, there's, it's almost a balance to find. I mean, you don't, that we, we, we teach ourselves to never be vulnerable to always stay strong and you know I, I just have this joke around here that every time I look tired and my roommates are like oh you look tired I just say no I'm never tired <laughs> you know it's just kind of yeah what we do as professional athletes but then you as you say there's the other side of it with the just the public and the media around triathlon and developing our profiles and uh, people want to see you know the no bs approach just the real people behind the athletes and so I, yeah i think there's a balance of time i also don't want to fall into the part that it's like i'm almost trying to find bad parts or negative things that have not really affected me but it's almost like you you're trying to find something like for me i feel like i haven't had any huge negative experience in my life i haven't had any touch wood you know massive crash or you know just really bad family drama or whatever you know so yeah just ha have to be really just real and honest and that's it yeah, yeah yeah isn't it weird yeah there's a weird thing out in our society like you know when you overcome this big massive trauma you know it's like oh my god you're like put on this pedestal but then there's also you know a lot of people out there that's like, you know, my parents loved me and, you know, I liked going to triathlons when I was a kid and like, you didn't have any, like a lot, like massive turbulence, but that, that doesn't mean like your story isn't just as powerful. Right. It's a, there's this small little story just that I always think about linked to that is for example, we knew someone that was an alcoholic and that smoked a lot and all that. And then, he started, I can't remember exactly, but he started going into sports, quit everything, 
And I told my dad, and I was younger, you know, this was 10 years ago or something. And I was like, oh, that's so awesome, you know, just to be able to do that change. And my dad was like, well, yes, but don't you think it's awesome for me that me, your dad, I never got into alcohol. I never smoked. I always had, you know, a good life. Obviously, nothing, nothing's perfect, but, you know, everything went more or less well. And I kept myself away from all these negative things. You know, it's just kind of something that stayed with me. It's, you know. It's true. We always yeah. put these people on a pedestal and it's awesome if you can really change your life around, but it's also awesome if you didn't get into those things in the first place. <laughs> right. Right. Like, right. Yeah, yeah. Like, can we celebrate that we, we chose to take this path? Like we chose to tend to ourselves every day versus like, I'm going to wait till it sucks enough. And then <laughs> yeah. when it sucks enough, I'm going to change. Like, why do we always have to wait to that moment? And the same, like you haven't had, I love this. You haven't had any you know, major crash injury, anything like that. But yet you're going to go work with a, a person in Europe about your run form and your body structure and you're taking the proactive things mm-hmm. to, to do exactly what your dad probably did is like pay attention to what's going on while it's going on so that you don't have to wait till the, the big crash happens. Yeah, and I mean, my dad's big for that. He's always, he, he likes emailing me about just stuff that he sees, you know. And he, he's not my coach in any way or has never been my coach, but... He just taught me throughout my childhood to just attention to detail, always improve, stay humble, which means you're staying a student in the sport or just whatever you're doing. And just, yeah, always try to find the extra things because you're never really there. Nothing's perfect and you can always improve. So. And yeah, right that's, now, that's, that's that. yeah, that's pushing me to, to do just that. Yeah. And it's keeping your mind open. It's keeping you open to learning. It's keeping you open to be able to say, okay, here's uh, what I found unacceptable about, you know, losing this time in St. George, but I'm going to use it as a way to absorb more knowledge. I got more tactics out of it and I'm going to take that and I'm going to apply that to further myself along the path. And that's really what you need to do to fulfill this goal that you have to be the to be, and maybe you've got better words around it, but what I've heard you say is like that you want to be the best at whatever it is that you choose to do. And in order to do that, we got to use everything to our advantage. And that doesn't mean like a selfish disposition. What that means is we take the good, we take the bad, we take the highs, we take the lows. We don't minimize our story because we haven't had a massive trauma. Um, and we use it all to our advantage to move move yourself, really accelerate yourself on this path towards this bigger umbrella goal of being the best in the world in Kona. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. Not not really much sad, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right, let's um, go. So the PTO, I was uh, on there. I mean, it's so great. There are it's like, it's really all you need now, right? Like, it's almost like you don't need a personal website anymore. Like they're really providing what you need. But I started to dork out on the head to head. Like, so I took you. (laughs) This is what I've been doing for the last 48 hours. And I'm putting you head to head on the stats page. Um, So have you done that at all? Or is that just like, you got to stay away from that? Or have you done it? Yeah, just with the other athletes so that you can just Yeah, like you can put yourself. athlete that you've ever raised. Yeah. 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 And you have all the numbers, the swim, the bike, the run. And yeah, that, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Does your dad get, get on that kind of stuff for you yeah, like on your he, behalf? He Does he looks, get excited? I mean, he's just really passionate with the sport and has been since he was 27 when he quit his job in New York to become a professional triathlete early 80s. <laughs> so yeah. And he's, he just loves everything about it. The, the training, the process, the racing, the athletes. So. Yeah, he looks at the rankings, the numbers, and all that. Yeah. I love it. I actually didn't realize that he was a professional um, or that he quit his job to go pursue it. So, um, Speaking our language. Yeah, that's totally speaking our language. And I do want to talk about um, the Collins Cup. I know we mentioned it earlier, but I kind of want to pull on this thread about um, – so here you've got your dad who went after his dreams, and there is – a lot of people that are too scared to do that, you know, to let go of that paycheck or maybe they're not good enough or not patient enough. And so for you, how important it is, and it might just have always been this way for you, is to just go after your dreams. Yeah, and I mean, that's uh, massively linked to my parents and my dad because they always, uh, they were never like, oh, no, you you can't do sports or, you know, people make no money in sports. They already... They always pushed me to 
do well at school and also have something on the side that I'm really passionate about. And very early, that was triathlon, and they always pushed me to do that. Never, yeah, just never had anything to tell me, you know, you have to be a lawyer <laughs> or something like that. Mm-hmm. It was really open to whatever I wanted to do, and it became triathlon, and they just uh, supported me till the end of college, and then I became financially independent thanks to all their support the previous years, and been awesome really i mean just yeah best parents ever full full support oh that's, <laughs> awesome. that's, that's really awesome. i hope they listen <laughs> mom and dad you're the best um i love when we have people on the show who I, i'm 49 like i could pretty much be your mother and i'm always i always think about the moms or the dads you know the people that we're interviewing and i just want to do a a great job um on their behalf because i know uh you know we're holding we're holding a, a son yeah. here like yeah you're a professional triathlete you're super badass uh, we're going to see you do great things in your life. I know we are, but you're also somebody's son, right? <laughs> like I want to mm-hmm. hold that, hold that really, uh, tender and in my heart. Um, so speaking of heart and dreams, when you think about, well, let me ask you this. Um, this kind of brings me back to another thing with, uh, that I remember from our interview with Ellie and she talked about how she has, she wants to be 70.3 world champion. That's kind of her immediate goal. And so she visualizes that. And have you done any visualization of being at the top of the podium in Kona? Uh, yes, but obviously it's not immediate visualization because, I mean, I haven't even done an Ironman yet. But, I mean, same yeah. as Ellie, yes, being 70.3 world champion would be more of an immediate goal. But, yes, the, the overarching goal is Kona. And we kind of do that in every training session for – I've done it for the last, you know, 10 years. Yes, you do visualize races and see yourself kind of at the top. But also, you can't do that too much, I feel like, because if it's almost like you're forgetting the, the present and what you need to do to get there. So it's kind of a, a balance to to find. And, yeah, just between those two, just the, the next two races and, yeah, just the, the training you need to, to to in order to get to that highest level. Yes, yeah, the um, it's having the goal but not being attached to to that goal. You know, the, the feelings of it has or must go a certain way. Like there's a path to go. It's kind of like training. Like you need to do X, Y, and Z to get there. But there's many ways to get there. And so I love that you have this Kona dream like out in front. But you know, right now in this moment, it's it's about today's training session, and then tomorrow's training session, and then you'll come upon seventy point three worlds, and then you'll get your first Ironman, and Mm. Then you'll get to Kona and then you'll win Kona and then you'll win it like six times and then, <laughs> or seven times. Huh. So you have the record. And then it's like, just be patient, right? And, and, and enjoy this. I know it's overused, but this journey, like really soak up every moment of it so that you can appreciate and, and, and live it and, and feel it and not rush things mm. too quickly. So do you ever feel yourself? I mean, it seems like you're a pretty patient dude, but. Do you feel ever the pressure, like you you need to be somewhere further along than where you are? Uh, sometimes because it's kind of like we know our, our career is kind of going to be over before we know it in a way. But also, you know, you just have to be patient. But uh, what you were saying reminded me of uh, these top athletes, especially in the Tour de France. And all these guys always asking them about the end of the tour. Do you think you can win? And they're at stage six, stage seven. And, you know, they always answer. I've always noticed that these best top general classification guy, they're always like, you know, we go day by day, you know, today was a good day and we have to just focus on tomorrow now and not think about later in the tour, a lot can happen, you know, and it's exactly the same, really, the, the journey towards objectives that are years in the future. You can't, you can control the present and just not really what's going to happen in years, so. Yeah, it reminds me of, um, you know, Claire Michelle, she's a Belgian triathlete, yeah. she races ITU. We had her on the show and we were talking about goals. And I think it was her coach, Paulo Souza, was saying that, you know, she was talking about goals, like, how, you know, she's got these big goals, but she's like, I've got these big goals that, you know, like the goal is way out here, but what that goal does, it's not living for that goal. It's, it's utilizing that goal 
that helps me determine how I'm going to be today, like how I'm going to show up today. Mm. And so that it's like these far off goals, these big goals. And I think everybody should have these big dreams um, to help them like show up for today because today is all we have. So you want to show up today as best you can, even if you're feeling crappy, like be the best you can when you're feeling crappy. Mm. And that might just be allowing yourself to feel crappy. Um, on the days where everything goes really well, like that's easy to show up for, but having these goals in the far off distance to allow yourself to remember that today is what you've got and show up for today. Yeah. And it's like you're, it's what's the saying your worst day your best day is the average of your worst days or something like that yeah 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 yeah. i can't remember what that (laughs) is but yeah i know what you're saying um yeah and i mean i feel terrible and i mean sometimes honestly i don't feel good at all in 80 percent of my workouts Mm -hmm. yeah you you keep going right it's just you know okay i'm not gonna be depressed because i had a bad workout I mean, yesterday, I just, my swim, for example, was just, I was so mad during the swim. I had rage inside of me. I wanted to scream. I was just so <laughs> pissed because I was swimming so slow. It didn't even feel easy. And I don't even understand why. You know, everything's good with my body. And, you know, it's, it's pro triathlete stuff. Okay, I was maybe four or five seconds slower for 200, you know but consistently and it didn't feel good and it just pissed me off so much but I, it's always the attitude i'm not going to let this define my mood of the day you know it's just it's the process a lot of workouts are not going to be good and you can just hope that little by little you know you just keep plugging away have the good attitude every day and it'll work out and usually it does yeah so. <laughs> and you and you can't have the you can't have the good workouts without the bad ones you would have nothing to compare it with you would be like good. You wouldn't even know good because you would never have bad. Yeah. So I know in an athlete's mind is like I always want it to be good, but you got to have that contrast in order to know how far you've come. You need to have these experiences where it's like a drag. Um, and it sounds like that's what you had yesterday. Where where do you swim in Boulder? What's your what's your pool? At the, the Colorado Center? Athletic Club uh, on Twenty Ninth Street. Oh yeah, yep. Oh yeah, yeah. It's one of it's yeah, twenty five meters outdoors, and there's a hot tub, so it's perfect. Yeah. Are your hot tubs open? Are you going to make me really jealous here? Your they top, never close. Hot tubs open? <laughs> what? Oh, that's ridiculous. That's well, it's, out, it's outside. <laughs> the indoor one closed. Yeah. Oh, the indoor one. Oh, yeah. Well, I guess, I mean, the, um, pool, the gym, the actual gym closed for maybe a month last year in March or something, but that's it. It's not it's always open. Dude, ours was broken and then COVID hit. So it's like uh, I'm doing. I might fly to Boulder and get myself in. <laughs> yeah, we a always hot, get our hot, hot tub, tub in action before and after the swim. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I like that before yeah. and after. Yeah, because that trip between the hot tub and the pool. I know it's not that far because I know that pool, but it's cold. Yeah, but it gets it, it gets swear. your body time warmer, and so you feel like you want to go mm-hmm. in the pool. A lot of yeah. people always <laughs> go straight to the water, even though it's snowing. And I'm like, why don't you want to go in the hot tub? They're like, well, the water's going to feel colder. And I'm telling them, well, it's actually the opposite. <laughs> yeah, because your body's warm. Your body's warm, yeah. then hey. even colder water doesn't feel that cold because you're so warm in your body. Yeah. I like <laughs> you got a secret there. You, you're finding out what works for you and you're, and you're using it. Um, so let's see. Let's talk about the Collins Cup a little bit. Uh, Beach, what were you just looking at on I think there? You were, you're up, up to second, right? Right behind Sam, I want to say, after um, Yeah, after I think April. I've been Not staying second behind. because there was – well, I was first for just a small time there because there was Ben Hoffman originally ahead of me and – or T.O. at one point. But they haven't been doing their – good Ironmans and so they lost points and then Sam just passed me so I'm still second yeah so he's I think he's fifth in the world now and I'm eighth yeah but uh I mean the Collins Cup is yeah it's huge for us actually this is going to be a awesome event financially and just with the media the media is going to be unlike anything there's been in triathlon there's going to be so many cameras. It's going to be a real pro montage. It's going to be live on some major channels. Uh, it's going to be a real show. And there's going to be so much happening because there's going to be all the women and the men and all these different head-to-heads, international Europe versus USA at the same time. And the commentators are going to have all these stats and 
yeah, I think it's going to be really awesome. It's going to be a show. It's going to be a show for sure. So um, I think we can't get this message out enough to people because even if they're not triathletes, like this is going to be such a show to watch. Any sports fan is going to want to get a piece of this action, uh, either as an athlete, professional athlete being there or as a spectator watching it uh, across the globe. So can you describe to our like to our listeners, like what the Collins Cup is? Because this is the first of its kind. Yeah, so it's essentially like the Riders Cup in golf to determine which are the best athletes in triathlon. So there's three main teams, Team International, Team Europe, and Team USA. And there's going to be the six best athletes, men, six men, six women per team. And they're going to go head-to-head. So there's going to be essentially... um, how many is that? So that's 18 athletes. So six, six head to heads per gender. So there's going to be 12 races going at the same time with one athlete from each region. And there's going to be a point system based on obviously who wins those, all those head to heads. And it's all going to happen at the same time. And it's just going to be an awesome show just uh, because we don't have that usually in travel. It's always individual. So this is going to be more of a team sport, even though within the race, we'll be racing on our own. But there's going to be tactics and there's team captains and there's going to be a draft to know who's going to race who. It's going to be really interesting. Oh, cool. I didn't yeah. know that. Um, and then will there be like, will it be Team International, Team Team Europe and Team USA, like three athletes going head to head or is it two per race? Three. No, it's it's one. It'll be all three. So It'll each be three race will have one like, European, one international, and one American. And there's going to be six of those going at the same time. And then six more for the women. And um, what's the distance? It's same as Daytona. So it's 100 kilometers. 2K swim, 80K okay. bike, 18K run. And what's the course like? Do you know? Have they released that? Do you know anything uh, about the course? I don't know exactly, but it's around Samarin, where there's the Challenge Championship. So it's, the bike right. will be pretty flat. The swim swim okay. is in the, the Danube, in the river. And the run, it's more or less flat. It, I mean, I don't know exactly if it's like the Challenge Championship. The Challenge Championship has some parts where you run on the uh, horse, on the the horse grass, track, right? a bit of grass. Yeah. And then on the side of the river. But it's more or less uh, pretty flat and fast. That's so cool. And the date of that is August twenty eighth. Twenty August twenty eighth. Awesome. And when will the final selections for the teams be announced? Do you know? Yeah, it's um, they take the final ranking as of I think July thirty first. So by then, yeah, you'll just okay. be you'll see where where our ranking is at, and they'll take top six per region. So what do you have well, between it's not now top, it's and... Not, sorry, it's top four per region based on points. Yeah. And then two discretionary captain picks. Yeah. And who are the captains? There's um, there's three captains for and each Crow team. Is. Crow, Crow is, is one, one of for the captains, team right? Mark Allen for Team USA. Um, for Team Europe. Can't remember. Oh, um, I can't remember either. Um, and then there isn't there female captains? Yeah, so I there's think Karen Smyers is, is on is one it... of them. Uh, there's uh, maybe Chrissy Wellington for Team Europe. I think mm-hmm. so. Yeah. Um, I guess we could pull that up. Can you pull that up, Eve? Yeah. Um, and what do you have between now and the end of July? Like, what are you planning on for races? So I'm going to head to Europe around mid-June and then do 70.3 European champs in Denmark. June 27, and then do the 70.3 Les Sables, Les Sables d'Olonne, which is my club in France, uh, July 4th. And then right after that, I'm going to go to Lanzarote for two weeks, um, see this uh, uh, sports guy, um, Osteo, multiple times over the two weeks, uh, you know, do things like do a long ride or an interval, then I'll see him. Then do a, a, a interval bike and then run hard off the run uh, run hard off the bike and then see him and then just see him fresh and the, he'll just look at all my body and just see kind of 
Yeah, like where you're absorbing right. it. Right. Hopefully, where you're see why essentially just yeah. my lower back gets really tight when I'm running off the bike. Because it yeah. doesn't really get tight on the bike. It's just when I run off the bike in a race. So, yeah, we'll just see mm-hmm. that. And then, yeah, that'll be pretty much end of July. And then just train in Southeast France um, till the Collins Cup. Now, you were planning on doing an Ironman this year. Is that still on the table? No, because uh, I was I wanted to do Ironman France. That was in June. That's why yeah. I wasn't going to peak for St. George. I was planned to peak for uh, June, and I guess I'll still do that, even though I would have liked to peak for St. George, um, knowing the field and just the hype around it, and especially that it's not sure uh, European champs is going to happen. Um yeah, they postponed it to the week before St. George World in September, Ironman France. Uh, so that's not going to work. So instead of just doing another Ironman and just not really being, I don't know, I just really want to do Ironman France as my first one. I just decided to just postpone one year and do Ironman France next year. So There you go. Just stay in flow with it, right? Like we, every moment we have a choice to fight what's going on or just be like, okay, like pivot, make another choice, stay focused on 70.3. You know, you know, no, you might be on the top of that podium in, in September Mm -hmm. and perhaps doing an Ironman would have been too much of a output, Mm -hmm. right? Like we just don't know. Like we don't know when things look like, uh, like I didn't want it to go this way. At least personally, when I feel that I always remind myself, like, I don't know the whole story yet. Yeah. Like, I don't know the whole story. Yeah, no, yeah exactly. There's no need to force it. I was maybe going to do Iron Man Coeur d'Alene June 27. But it just, I don't know, I saw the bike. I mean, there's it's quite a nice area, and uh, it's pretty hilly on the bike, which I like. But I also saw the bike is on a highway, and it's an out and back, which doesn't fully ex- excite me like Nice. And then I just wanted to do it really the pro way, you know, have it no June, January 1st when I start training for the year, have it in my mind, okay, in June I have the race. I didn't want it just to be like, it was what, six weeks before the race, before after St. George, deciding which what I was going to do. And just be like, oh, okay, maybe I'll do an Ironman, this thing I've been thinking about for the last 20 years of my life, you know. <laughs> I just want to do it right, do the race I want to do, the one that excites me the most. And South of France, I mean, just the course is so awesome. And I know all these people from growing up there. And ra- that's when I started racing. It was just all these local races in South of France. So, yeah, stick, stick yeah. to that plan. Yeah. And one do year you- is not, yeah, exactly as you said. I can still do great at mm-hmm. 70.3s, and it's not a lost year. So, just do it next year. Yeah. No. It's never a loss. No. no, there's no, no effort is a waste, as we say. And it's like, it's okay to do it the way, like to plan it the way you want to plan it. It's okay to like choose what you want to do because you love to do it this way. Like it, you've got, you've got that. You've created this, you've set yourself up for this path in life that you're doing what you love. So if you're doing what you love, do it the way that you love to do it. And do it where you love to do it. And so tell people why you love the south of France so much. Uh, I mean, it's where I grew up. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world. The cycling is awesome. Um, yeah, it's just all the people I know there. Uh, I think Ironman France is just one of the best Ironmans out there in the whole world. And uh, it's just fun roads, really. It's not a wide highway on the bike. It's the perfect mix of flats. Uh, hills, uh, technical downhills, faster, yeah, faster and slower sections, and uh, the run on the Promenade des Anglais, just there on the seashore, out and back. That that's flat and fast. So I, I like actually hard bikes and then faster runs. So, and I mean, I can stay yeah, at home like... before the race, <laughs> be with my dog. Yeah, <laughs> so, I yeah, I was watching. Um... I was watching, uh, as I've said, I was binging on you uh, leading into this interview. And um, two things. One, I was watching this. I think it was a PTO video of you. Like you did this six and a half hour ride where you were doing like three big climbs that were all about 13 to 15 mile climbs. Is that in that area that you're talking about? It is. You just have to drive. That's just this massive ride we do sometimes, like usually once a year in the summer. And yeah, you have to just drive like about an hour away, but more or less the area. But that's just the 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 high actual higher mountains. Ironman France is still just more the pre Alps, 
not the, the real, you know, big like Alpe d'Huez climbs or whatever that we know from the Tour yeah. de France. But so it's the perfect, that's what I was saying. It's the perfect mix. It's not just big mountain passes. But yeah, that ride is mm. epic. It's just, as you said, 14,000 yeah. feet of climbing, 100 miles. And it's just, used, it's the highest road in Europe, actually. The first mountain pass goes up to almost 2,900 meters. And uh, yeah, it's really, really beautiful. Yeah, it looked gorgeous. The roads looked beautiful. Um, and so did that box of pastries that you had. You, you got a little sweet tooth, yeah, don't you? Yeah, that's something you like we dessert? had. It was kind of a, a thing we used to do because we used to do a lot of bike races when I started being 14, 15, 16, 17. And we'd always, you know, go to the bike race on Sunday and then always go to our favorite pastry shop. Uh, and always, it's kind of a tradition to always do that. And my dad has a sweet tooth too, so perfect yeah we just always <laughs> like do that <laughs> you can get away with that and then the other thing i uh did watch this day in the life and you were swimming in this pool is that your parents house because i saw a dog yeah. that was running around is that your is that a pool at your yeah, parents so house uh, that that pool was built that's, by that's my dad epic in uh around nine in the 90s 1990 right around the right before i was born and uh it's very very convenient and awesome to have that at home <laughs> and yeah i was like that's got to be his parents house mm-hmm. because that looks like a triathlete like yeah. said because that's a long 20, pool yeah, i'm like 20, that looks like legit. 25 <laughs> yeah that looked like legit distance and your dog was running around that's awesome too so do your parents live there full time yeah southeast france just a little inland from Kent. And yeah, that's that's where I go back every year, just multiple times a year for just racing in Europe. And yeah, and as I mean, with the train, the pool, that's perfect, obviously, and the the riding and running. I mean, yeah, it's perfect for training. Really, it's perfect yeah, to have these two bases between Boulder and south of France. You know, you can I can just go out and back and chase the competitions. And, yeah. Yeah, dude, you got the setup. And you've uh, sweet. You've raced Oceanside, so what do you th- what do you think about SoCal? Yeah, Oceanside's a nice <laughs> course too. Yeah, I enjoy that race. Um, it, it's a good one every year. Just usually the one of the good uh, high level races, you know, every year at the beginning of the year. So yeah, we're looking forward hopefully, to that coming. Yeah, back. hopefully with COVID, uh, yeah, California will get back yeah. to their senses. Yeah, that race is about <laughs> yeah. a mile and a half, about a mile Up and a half street. that way. But yeah, things are things are looking good in this area. But Beach just pulled yeah, up so those captains for captains Collins for Cut. Europe is Norman Stadler and Chrissy Wellington. That's right, Norman uh, Stadler, and then Aaron Baker and and Crowe for uh, for oh. Australia, for, and then Karen uh, Smyers inter- and Mark well, Allen. Mark Allen. International, so international, Canada, yes. Australia. Yeah. yeah, a bunch of others actually. But. I think my favorite Norman Stad. I mean, I'm sure he's like. Like, God, does everybody remember this? But I don't know if you ever remember this, um, Rudy, when he his, he was having, like, massive mechanicals right. on the bike in Kona, and he's just on the side of the road, like, slamming his bike, like, stupid yeah. bike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I remember that, actually. Was, I went to Kona the first time in 98. So that was those years, 98 yep. and 2003 mm-hmm. or 2002, 2006. Yeah. That was Sadler, McCormack. Uh, I remember um, what's her name. Um, I can't remember her name. Yeah, I, there I actually is... met her. <laughs> this uh, U.S. girl. No, was she? Forget about it. Let's see. Back in those days, it was like Michaela Jones. Yeah, yeah, uh... yeah that's, that's, there we go. Michaela, yeah. yeah, yeah, she's here. She's, she's here just, in uh, Southern we California. We were just swimming next to her in the pool the other day. Who do you? Um, she's still crushing it. Speaking of those names, yeah. is there anyone that you? Is there anyone that you look up to? I know you probably look up to your dad um, most often, but is there any professional that that you've sort of just you know um, gravitated to? Maybe not seek sought out as a um, a guide, um, but just someone that you you align with that maybe you resonate with what their philosophy is and how they how they performed in the sport uh yeah i mean a guy i was a big fan of uh crowey because mm. that's more when i was starting to be competitive you know 2010 around then and also now he's the team manager for our vespa uh triathlon team so I, i've been in contact with him more and talked to him on the phone about 
yeah, just tra- being a pro triathlete and how to manage the life around that. So, and how to cruise yeah. around in a Vespa. Was that? <laughs> and how to cruise around in a Vespa. Yeah, yeah, we're actually, <laughs> we haven't gotten them yet, but we're, we're, we're getting them this week. So that'll be exciting because traffic in Boulder is starting to get oh. to, to that summer traffic. So it'll be good to scoot around. Yeah, Boulder but, yeah, is so, yeah. Boulder's like a big city now. Like we lived there 2001 to 2010 um down in like South Boulder by like where Southern Sun is and all of that like in South Boulder. There was like nothing down there and now it's uh, kind of yeah. like and downtown yeah, it, area. It just but, happened a few days ago. As you just noticed all the, I don't know what happened really. All of a sudden this, this main 28th street is packed all day long. Mm, and yeah, this it just toys. happened. Like it, there was no one two weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, a Vespa is going to be perfect for cruising yeah. around. It's going to be that's going to be the perfect thing for cruising around. Um, yeah, and uh, how cool is that? That Crowe is somebody you looked up to, and now here you are, like being able to talk to him. Like, is this just like kind of like dream come true? Is this confirming that you're on the right path? Yeah, and it's not only that, but just a lot of. Uh, with a lot of the people I get to meet and just through racing and around racing, definitely kind of a dream come true. Just kind of, yeah, I just talk to some of the legends of the sport and uh, interact with them. And yeah, so it's just, yeah, that's how it is. Just getting up to this level and it's pretty awesome for the Yeah, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> it's what it looks like when you're living your dream. Um, what, I know we talked about you know, hard work and, and showing up and all of that. But is there anything in particular or memory that you have of um, your dad that you've really pulled on uh, through your professional career? Any teaching? Um, well, there was this uh, race in, in 2006 in Hawaii. And uh, my dad had a problem with this anti-fog he put in his goggles. And they went to, into his eye. And uh, he did the whole bike and run with... <laughs> absolutely horrible shooting pains in his eyes where he couldn't even open his eyes anymore he'd be going down the hill on the bike going 60 k's an hour and had to it would hurt so bad he'd have to close them for multiple seconds you know with the winds <laughs> and he was in such high pain and he actually almost you know messed up completely the inside of his eye because this this entire race you know just this the liquid was in his eye and burning so bad but he was just so strong mentally and he knew his kids, his children were there and he really wanted to finish. And it was a huge disappointment because obviously he was training for it for many months and he was in such good shape, but that obviously derailed it a lot. But yeah, this so is something you- I remember just like being really strong, being a role model for me and yeah, just going to the end of what you've started. Mm, yeah. Yeah. What um how do you train your mind? I know you can do it through workouts, but how do you how do you how are you creating mental toughness? How are you creating the ability to to separate what you're feeling ver- and what you're thinking versus what's actually happening? Uh yeah, I mean it, it for sure it's every day in training, but it's also outside of training. It's just little things like for example, if I have a desire in me, I don't know, or I have some kind of discomfort in any thing I'm doing any day I won't relieve that discomfort right away it's kind of like just train your mind like okay I can be 10 more minutes in this what I'm doing being very uncomfortable but then I'll do whatever I need to do to you know be comfortable again it's kind of not very clear as an example but no it's it's Perfect. No, it's you're, like you're, you're, not, you're not blocking it. You're, you're sitting in it, sitting like embracing it. Like, okay, let's get right. To know exactly, each other. and you can do that for so many things. Just like, oh, I'm really hungry right now. I'm just, I'm gonna wait. Okay, it's five thirty. I'm not eating till six. But if you're busy or something, not that I don't want to eat. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, and so yeah, I think that's just how you train uh, your mental toughness. Just, just little things every day. Uh, just have discipline, really. Yeah, and I think um, you know we're we're yoga teachers as well, and we teach yoga to athletes. And one of the things that we encourage them to do through the yoga class, the yoga class is much more about the mind training than you know the gymnastics of the class. Although that 
helps with the body tremendously, is that we're asking them to practice not responding to every impulse of the mind, which is essentially what you're doing. And when we do that, you're saying like, no mind, I'm in charge. Like I'm in charge because you know, like as soon, because we're hardwired to not be in that discomfort, but for you to really fulfill this dream and to live the life that you want to live, you've got to, you've got to be in charge of that mind because every single time it's going to want to put you back into comfort. Yeah. And I mean, the main thing, yeah, the main thing is really in training. I mean, there's so many times where, yeah, we're having a terrible workout or something hurts or yeah, legs hurt or really bored or just, yeah, just so many instances. And every single day I would just get it done and, you know, just finish what I started and yeah, keep on going. And yeah, that just really builds your mental toughness. Really. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a great chat. I can't wait to share it. I think we got to see another side of you. Um, thanks for opening up to us. And uh, do you have another uh, workout on the books today? What do you do? Yeah, I'm going to go ride right now. Uh, ran, I ran this morning and then I'll have a swim too. Nice. So, yeah, all three today. Cool. Typical day. Yeah, get, <laughs> to, yeah. get to work, buddy. It's your job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> awesome. Well, we're looking forward to, you know, following what's going on this, um, this summer with you and the Collins Club. And to see you in person in September back in St. George will be awesome. So we'll be cheering you on there. And, uh, yeah, thanks again for your time today, Rudy. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you for having me.